Here we are then. People have wanted this for a long time. I've done a lot of lists, but so far they've pretty much consisted entirely of good games. This is different. This is the 100 worst. In the course of making so many videos, so many documentaries, or just playing games, I've played a lot of rubbish. I've uncovered lots of stories about rubbish games too, and in this video I've done my best to put all of them together. It's been quite the ride. The best thing to do I think is to go through this horrible 100 alphabetically. It seems silly to try and actually do a countdown when we have so many woeful examples of gaming to go through, and trust me they all absolutely belong here. Before we begin properly I should set a few expectations. Firstly, this is a retro list, only going up to the PS2. Even if there are plenty of terrible modern games that could go on this list, I feel that they need a little bit more time before I could put them in an all-time list. Also, we're sticking with games that got commercial releases. No bootlegs, no crazy bus or things like that. Now if you're familiar with my work, you may expect a slant towards European platforms. You will be seeing lots of ZX Spectrum and Amiga, believe me. If you're not familiar with those platforms, <laughs> well, you are in for a treat. Also, I've tried to avoid a lot of very obvious choices. Games that are utterly infamous and have been covered many times over. To give a few examples, you will not see Superman 64, Plumbers Don't Wear Ties, Big Rigs, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, E.T. or a bunch of other very well-known awful games. I like to take a different path, and even if these games aren't there, I believe that this list more than stands up to anything else out there. It is filled from end to end with nothing but the very worst games, horrific titles that you may not even know about. It's going to be a wild journey. So all we have to do now is turn the key and get moving. So let's do that. <laughs> start off with um, a weird one. The A-Team on the C64 is pretty close to breaking the wall for no homemade titles or anything like that because I'm really not sure if it got any kind of release at all or was struck down for being such a flagrant bastardisation of the licence it spawned from, but a very obscure software house called Corbois Software is credited with making it along with a few other titles back in the 1980s. Things are so hazy when it comes to microcomputer games that I have to assume this was sold commercially in some form. Anyway, this game is so utterly strange in its awfulness. It starts on the title screen which, rather than the 18 theme you would expect, features an awful rendition of the Star Wars main theme. <laughs> Well, this is the game itself. You're firing up at the faces of the A-Team. And that's all the game is. You do this until you die. Could you class this as a game where you play as the villain, seeing as it's your job to take down everyone's favourite quartet of crack operatives? <laughs> that would be taking the piss, surely. Akira. The film that introduced so many people to anime back in the late 80s and early 90s. And how did we repay it? Well, not just with a bunch of projects that never ended up being finished, but with an utterly garbage Amiga game that might make you thankful that other efforts never saw the light of day. The game switches between Kaneda for hideous turbo tunnel style riding sections, and Tetsuo for some dreadful platforming. No matter what it does, the game's ineptitude is never not apparent, and it stands as one of the most risible attempts at recreating a licensed product in the entire Amiga library. And we are obviously going to see far more terrible licensed games. But what we've got in this list could well send the more famous tie-in disasters crying all the way home. It's not just enough to get over the fact that ALF got a licensed game for the Master System, you then have to contend with it being easily the most incompetent, broken and hopeless game on the whole platform. A completely stupid adventure type game where that ugly Italian dies no matter what hits him with no attention paid to perspective, he has to contend with flashers for enemies, and the game is so roughshod that Alf literally cannot turn around without disappearing completely for a frame. Maybe he just quickly teleports back to his home planet, I don't know. And that ear bleeding music too, this is quite a shocker. If you think Alf's a weird licensed product, <laughs> think again. 
for there exists a tie-in game for bloody all dogs go to heaven, shown here for the Amiga. Yes, the rather sad Don Bluth animated film with an even more tragic backstory. How do you even go about a game for this? Well, this introduces a common theme you'll find in a lot of games on this list. Why make just one bad game when you can make several terrible mini-games? At best, the games here are boring, at worst, utterly nonsensical, the sound consists of samples that repeat themselves after about 5 seconds, and the quality of the graphics and frame rate quite simply speak for themselves. It's bad enough that this exists, but the quality of this title actually makes the Akira game that we've just seen actually look half decent. And the strange licenses just keep on coming. Yes, your eyes do not deceive you. There exists a licensed game for Allo Allo, the BBC French Resistance comedy show with the funny mispronunciations, the hilarious Nazis, and the Madonna with the big boobies. So listen carefully, for I will say this only once. This game is a pile of festering cat shit. A classically baffling Euro platformer type game where you have to waste endless amounts of time collecting bullshit and our heroic Rene is utterly useless, capable of little but throwing random items at enemies that'll just stun them for a couple of seconds if that. The only amusing thing to see here is at the start, where you can find a dog having an eternal piss outside of the cafe, for some reason. I like to think that this was the developer's subtle commentary on the awful game that they were making. As the PS2 becomes thoroughly retro, the worst games of the system are getting more attention, and the likes of Phoenix games are becoming more notorious. This is but the first title we'll see of theirs, and Animal Soccer World is surely destined to join the pantheon of universally recognised atrocities in future, right up there with your supermans and big rigs. This is almost like a new form. It's not just that the game is awful and features little except simplistic jigsaws and other kid-friendly minigames, it's the cartoon itself that ties all these low quality games together. The animation is what you would expect from something that was made in North Korea in the 1960s, complete with blatant ripoffs of many a famous Disney film character, the plot makes less than zero sense, and then there's the voice acting. It is a nonsensical product. There's an attempt to make a cartoon that kids would enjoy, and more like the stream of consciousness ravings of some amphetamine laced wacko on a diet of evangelical Christian broadcasts and number stations. Absolutely incomprehensible, awful even for Phoenix. The other two games we're going to see from them are hideous, but they still aren't even close to this one. From Phoenix Games to another legendarily bad studio, Tynesoft. We're going to see these Geordies quite a few times. The stories of debauchery and grotesque antics from these guys in the 80s are legendary, and as entertaining as their games are, well, beyond the pale. Their game based on Alf Vida's own pet is a great example. Like a lot of their games, it's a whole bunch of mini-games, and they're all awful. You can build a brick wall, which means to simply find a spot where you can go straight up and avoid all the stationary masks that are supposed to represent the face of Herr Grunwald. Take yourself to the beer keller and neck all the dregs of pints you can find, before then drunkenly walking home and trying not to kill yourself by hitting a parked car. It's all written entirely in the basic microcomputer language, and all ridiculously inept. It's odd. You would think that a Newcastle-based studio would go an extra mile for such a famously Geordie-centric show, but you would be one. So very, very bloody one. It's odd how games that centre on having eco-friendly messages tend to be so bloody dreadful, isn't it? That just seems to be the case every friggin' time. Awesome Possum is Bubsy's even more annoying cousin, and his game is by far my least favourite Mega Drive title. There's more to it than the usual hallmarks of a Sonic ripoff, like a game that tries to be ultra fast but not only is shoddily made but completely fails to understand anything that made those games good, it's the character and his endless, utterly great in quips and assertions that he is actually awesome. He is thoroughly not awesome, and in the legendary words of Eminem, this game makes me want to spray an aerosol can up at the ozone layer. Forget about the NES Back to the Future game, it's nothing whatsoever compared to the worst games that spawned from the franchise. 
Back to the Future Part 3 knocks LJN's effort into a cocked Stetson hat. Once again, it's another collection of horrible minigames, although frankly you're not likely to see anything beyond the first level, which is another turbo tunnel style affair where you have to leap gaps and dodge endless projectiles, and is quite possibly the most annoying turbo tunnel ever constructed in a game. The fourth wall breaking crypts that accompany every restart of the stage do not help matters, and if anything just make the process even more frustrating. And why is it that every single version of this game is so blooming dark? Someone turned the brightness down to about 5 when they made this game. I mean, it's a novel approach. I suppose if people have to squint to see the game, they might not be able to fully appreciate just how terrible it actually is. But quite clearly it does not work at all. Rainbow Arts, for the most part, is a studio that I associate with really good games. Tons of classics, especially on the computers. However, they were not immune to the odd clanner, and Bad Cat? This is probably the worst game to come out with their name on it. Even if this was just on a magazine's cover disc, like some Rainbow Art games were, you would still feel ripped off by it. This completely ridiculous title features a bunch of levels with utterly roughshod obstacle courses that your streetwise cat has to traverse. Beyond the premise just being completely laughable and embarrassing, the controls are stupidly obtuse. It's disasters like this that could easily, easily have killed a young'un's love for computer games in one fell swoop. The few Beavis and Butthead games that do exist, for the most part, aren't all that bad. Virtual Stupidity is very good, and the Mega Drive game is actually also quite fun in its own way. But the SNES title is, of course, something completely different. I remember the sheer disappointment I experienced when I rented this, hoping for something similar to the Sega game that I really loved at the time. And instead you get this wretched side-scroller that feels like it sums up almost everything about the boilerplate, woefully generic licensed game that some studios were so keen to crap out in the 90s. You would need to have your head quite literally up your arse in order to extract any enjoyment whatsoever from it. Baby's Kids is famously one of the very worst games to come out on the SNES, and as such is right on the borderline of being a bit too famous for me to include here. And yet it's such a good combination of being both a preposterous license based on a stand-up routine by Richard Pryor, and also a terrible game, that it's too much in my wheelhouse for me to not include it. A useless beat-em-up with enemies that take ages to kill with normal attacks, usually to the point that using just lows will see you fall victim to the time limit. There are more powerful weapons in these kids' arsenals, but even if you utilise lows and get to further stages, you'll come to other areas that will be quite simply completely baffling. There is another reason why I include this game, mind you. I think that there are beat-em-ups that are actually worse than this one, and we are going to be seeing those later on. <laughs> it can get so much worse, believe me. Ah, the brilliant Don Priestley. Always famed on the spectrum for his games with massive cartoony graphics that really stood out on the system. The likes of Popeye, Trapdoor, Gregory Loses His Clock. Marvellous! But Benny Hill's madcap chase is not exactly one of his best moments. It is perhaps the game you would expect from a Benny Hill tie-in. The entire aim of the game is to collect items of women's clothing from a washing line and avoid being caught by the owner of said garments, and there's nothing else. Even for the specky the game is simplistic and dumb to the point of catatonia, and the slow speed that is often a necessary evil even in the Don's best titles just makes the whole exercise even more irritating than it would have been if it ran at a regular pace. I suppose the only saving grace is that there isn't some horrific beeper version of bloody yakety sax accompanying this utter pile of dumb. Tinesoft are back again with one of their few 16-bit games. One of their very last titles, in fact. The studio went damn near all in on this game and the license for Beverly Hills Cop, but it didn't work out and the Geordies went bust. This certainly didn't help that the game was, as is often the case with Tinesoft, awful. As usual, we have a different form of gameplay in just about every level, and whether it's a side on stage where you play as an emaciated Axel Foley plodding on at a snail's pace and getting hit by everything in sight, or an utterly ropey bit of 3D driving, or a top down affair that's basically the same as the side on stage is only at a different angle, the quality of each level is abysmal every single time. Just not happening, is it, lads? Right. 
I do have to include, I suppose, a couple of games that pretty much everybody knows. The big crowd pleasers, if you will. It helps all the more obscure microcomputer nonsense go down a little bit easier. And of the legendarily terrible games that are already very much in the Hall of Shame, Bible Adventures has to be one of my favourites, so to speak. I suppose you can tell already that I enjoy looking at titles that don't just fail with one game, but actually fail with multiple types. And this is a classic example, made even better by the hilarity of either carrying a whole ton of massive animals about with Noah, or watching an animal climb up the sky into infinity, or happily chucking baby Moses into the river. These gags may be popular, but they don't actually get old. It is the kin of the dreadful religious games for a damn good reason, and if I'm going to have a place for one of those on the list, it's just gotta be Bible Adventures to be honest. It's not like you can get much mirth out of King James Bible for the Game Boy after all. When I say that there are worse beat em ups than babies kids, this is one of the games I mean. Even if we have already seen a few terrible times, there aren't many as insipid as this miserable game based on big trouble in Little China. Walk along with your squad and fight the grand total of one enemy at a time in front of various differently coloured brick walls. That is if the enemy just doesn't go past you and then you can run away from them. To think of all the fun that could have been had with a big trouble in Little China game, but all it got was this utterly joyless pile. What a shame. It seemed that just about anyone could have got a tying game back in the 90s, even you and me, and few examples of that are better than a game with Bill Lambier as the star, a basketball player primarily known for fouls and fights more than buckets and dunks. It kind of befits the player in question then that Bill Lambier's game is a complete mess, a BTEC Speedball 2 ripoff where just the act of scoring two points is a nigh on impossible chore. It's bad enough to easily be the worst basketball tie-in out there. Even Shaq Fu can't step on a court with this utter misery of a future sports title. It exists purely as a reminder to play Speedball 2 more often instead of any of the game's laughable imitators. Here's a really special one for the Commodore 64 heads out there, the legendary Bionic Granny. The premise is an absolute classic. You play, for some reason, as a robotic grandmother, and you hate children. You hate them so much in fact, that you're waiting outside a school in order to zap them into oblivion, but you're thwarted in your quest by lollipop ladies who throw their signs at you. I suppose it's the sort of thing that could only have been made by some nameless teenager in their bedroom who probably got paid 20p by Mastertronic for their masterwork, but nowadays it feels like something taken from the pages of Scarfolk except it's actually fully real. And as incredible as the premise is, well the game is just as unspeakably bad. It utterly baffled people in 1984 and it still makes people wonder just what was in the water back then to this day. Was everyone so fatalistic, raised on a steady diet of Wimpy and Freds, to think that the thought of being vaporised by an octogenarian psychotic cyborg was a preferable escape from the doldrums of everyday life? Eh, that's for you to decide. While you decide, here's one of the channel's perennial favourites, BMX Ninja. A game that other great people from the UK scene have highlighted before, and one that almost has to be played every time I go on Twitch because the audience just demands it. Some people just can't get over it. You are apparently a ninja on a bike, having duels with other ninjas on bikes, where if either of your wheels touches the other, you'll immediately disappear in a cloud of dust never to return. Except you're hardly a ninja at all, and clearly the word ninja was tacked onto the game's title to sell a few more copies in the heady days of the 80s ninja boom. Can you use your two moves to defeat all the gans, save your girl, and become the hardest BMX ninja of them all? Well, with a bit of practice you most probably could, but that definitely doesn't mean that you should. We've had Spectrum, Amiga and C64 games already, and now it's time for Amstrad. Amstrad CPC fans can best be described as a bunch of mischievous blackguards who should be trusted at your own risk, and they often like to torture each other with endless requests for the much feared Bridget. What you have here is a terrible version of one of those old Nintendo game and watch handhelds. You use your keys to open and close bridges and stop your dumb lemon-esque people from falling into the water and drowning. 
Simple enough and surely hard to screw up, except the controls barely work, the look is grotesque, and the sound is a bloody weird mix of jingle bells and the Colonel Bogey march, shoved together with all the grace of a 15 car pileup and out of tune to the point of severe oral agony. Possibly the worst soundtrack in computer game history. It's a suitable enough accompaniment to such a bad game I suppose. Literally the only reason to play this lies in sadomasochism. Another one of my favourite crowd pleasers. I simply have to have Captain Novelin, the bloody SNES game that's all about a superhero who suffers from diabetes made by a strange company as a time for a brand of medication, on my list. Take careful note of what foods you ought to eat so that you don't jack up the captain's blood sugar, and watch out for all the sweet foods that have been turned into monsters plucked from your most surreal chocolate and cheese infused nightmares. You also get to learn so much about diabetes along the way. Apparently if you aren't laughing at the total stupidity of it all. What's funniest of all to me, really, is that Rare System's main aim, with games like Captain Novelin and others, was that they hoped to give sick kids something to play while they were in hospital. Because lord knows, if I'm a kid and I'm unfortunate enough to spend a lot of time in a hospital bed or a doctor's office, the first game that I want to play is some pile of shit that's all about my frigging condition. What an absolute winner of a premise. We don't need Action 52 on this list. Not when we have Cassette 50, the even better microcomputer version. 50 games on one cassette for just £10. This is quite something. Easily the most advertised computer game in the 80s UK scene, Cascade must have put the Cassette 50 advert in literally every computer mag every single month and had versions of Cassette 50 for near enough every platform. It was just a swarm. And of course it's here because the games are virtually all dreadful. The most basic and simplistic titles you can get, whether they're hideous rip-offs of the likes of Pac-Man and Space Invaders, and it was usually the case that you would have multiple rip-offs of said games on a single tape, or just the completely nonsensical likes of Field and Barrel Jump, which are the games we're seeing here. I suppose Action 52 could have learned a bit from Cascade's success, mind you. Because seriously, the Cassette 50 campaign went on for years. It was way more successful than Action 52 ever was. We just don't have taste over here, do we? Let's be honest. The PlayStation 2 years were, I suppose, the last hurrah for the lousy licensed game. There didn't seem to be as many after that, but it sure went out with some banners. Here, by example, is Charlie's Angels, which is in many ways the 3D answer to Bebby's Kids, an all-time terrible beat-em-up. Much like Bebby's Kids, enemies seem to take ages to kill, that is, unless you use the jumping kick attack which ploughs them down. Said jump kick sees the girls try and do some air cycling as they weirdly float about in the air, which is a good example of the quality of the animation on display here. <laughs> this game is just embarrassing. The silly dancing that the girls do whenever you stop controlling them for two seconds, how little the actors want to be doing any of these voices, the bit where Lucy Liu's character climbs a ladder for what feels like half an hour? Deary me. Get Free by Levines is probably the best part of this whole game, which just goes to show how atrocious it is. A terrible football game takes us into the list's second quarter, and it's a putrid PS1 street football affair by the folks at budget studio Midas. Chris Kamara's street soccer is just laughable. You may have hoped, when playing this, to see an abundance of old Cammy all over the place, perming up his hair and perhaps even contributing some happily confused commentary. But no, none of that at all. Just a flaccid football game with typically stupid AI, power shots and baffling goals. I suppose at least you can't just directly run the ball into the goal here, but that's only because you can't enter the D at all. At least I got that right about this type of football I suppose. In short, it's unbelievable, Jeff! Except for all the wrong reasons. I'm surprised that it's taken so long for us to reach one of the microcomputer's truly terrible arcade conversions, but finally here we are. For all the good parts of the C64, sometimes it really struggled when it came to racing games, and few games are a better example of that than Cisco Heat. 
take a pretty bloody busy Super Scalar Racer and turn it into um, Lisfin that appears to run at one frame per hour as graphics you would kill to get away from and controls that may as well not exist. It's not the worst C64 arcade conversion, and believe me that's coming, but it's right down there. Alas, while you could get some awesome conversions that really punched above their weight on micros, this is definitely not one of them. Oh boy, another truly terrifying title from the Amstrad coming up. Count Tuckula 2 is a very late game for 8-bit micros, coming out in 1992 at the time when they were pretty much all winding down, and while the final commercial days of a machine can produce the odd late gem, they can also produce games where it's so clear how little energy or fucks were being given to the machine at that point, and this is most certainly one of those. The Amstrad version takes the cake to the point where it's often been called the worst game in the machine's history. It is a platformer that, as you can see for yourself, moves slower than a turn-based strategy game. Worst of all, it pretty much can't be finished. The count cannot jump any further than the top of the screen, which in the end will put you in positions where you literally cannot reach the Mega Man-esque disappearing platforms that the game is littered with anymore. When games like this start to come out for your micro, yep. I'm afraid that's when you know it's time to move on. The mid-2000s were such an incredibly fertile cultural time, littered as they were with the likes of Little Britain, The Football Factory, Rebecca Luce doing awful things with farmyard animals, and of course, The Crazy Frog. The annoying thing that seemed to be on virtually every advert making that fucking noise and even getting a number one single. Quite frankly, it's a wonder how no one started a war with Sweden over the bloody thing back in the day, and this PS2 Mario Kart ripoff is but one artifact of Crazy Frog Mania. Even ignoring the fact that it stars Crazy Frog, it's one of the worst kart games ever made. The horrific thing's so dark that you'll have to turn the brightness on your telly to 100 just to see the tracks, and it all smacks of being knocked together in about 5 minutes or so. And as you might expect, the in-game music deeply irritates and contributes to a lethal cocktail that will take you kicking and screaming back to those days of eternal aggravation. Now available at your local CEX for about 5p, I would imagine. Even a great franchise is sometimes not immune to disaster. Now we know that, of course. But sometimes when it happens, it can be very baffling. Sega's Almighty Shinobi had terrific games out the wazoo before and after this. The Almighty Original, the spin-off with Alex Kidd, the handheld game, Revenge of Shinobi of course. So what the bloody hell happened when it came to Cyber Shinobi? Another one of the Master System's very worst titles, this one. It kind of feels like Sega tried to create a game that looked more like Revenge of Shinobi only on the 8-bit machine. And my word did they get it wrong, creating a painfully slow side-scroller that limps along so pathetically it feels like it would be more at home on the spectrum by way of a bunch of hacks like Teartex. It's perhaps not as well known as it should be despite the franchise, most probably because it never came out in either the USA or Japan where the system didn't perform so well. But in Europe and other places where the 8-bit console gained traction? Well, I'm afraid this was how Sega repaid us. Thanks Sega! It's often the case that a system's launch games don't usually hold up to too much scrutiny as the years go by. You would hope that better games would get released over time as people get to grips with the machine. And yet it's not common for a console to launch with an all-time terrible game that's amongst the worst in its genre. Unfortunately that's what happened with the Amiga CD32 which got paired up with Flare Software's hideous Dangerous Streets. There are many terrible Street Fighter 2 ripoffs out there, but this one is seriously from the very bottom of the barrel. And the bloody thing barely even uses any of the supposed advantages that the CD32 had, either over a regular Amiga or other platforms. 32 bit? <laughs> yeah, okay. Unfortunately, with games like Dangerous Streets flying the flag for the machine, the CD32 was basically doomed from the start. Dark Castle is another crowd pleaser type game, and certainly one of the Mega Drive's worst, but the thing that's perhaps most baffling of all is why it even exists in the first place. 
Who decided to take a Macintosh platformer that was well received but a few years old by this point and port it to the MD with virtually nothing changed but the addition of some colour and controls that are actually far worse than anything you would find on the Macintosh? You know, the Macintosh, that platform that was such a cornerstone of gaming history. I mean, the game even runs freaking smoother on the original computer than it does here in what's supposedly 16-bit console blast processing land. Our poor hero's pathetic and weak enough without having to use the D-pad to slowly move his rigid arm up to throw stones at bats instead of using the mouse. And then when falling down a step either kills you or stuns you enough for some other animal to have its way with this poor peasant, yeah, this is quite the shambolic botch job. Weird tie-in time once again. Fans of bad British 80s television may well be intrigued by the existence of a frickin' tie-in game for bloody Dempsey and Makepeace. Fans of lousy British 80s games may wonder why this title only appeared for the Amstrad and nothing else. It's odd for licensed games like this one to be a platform exclusive, after all. And then you play it and it just kind of makes sense. There's actually two types of game here. The main part, where you explore buildings, isn't actually all that offensively terrible but it's the driving section that ties the buildings together where the game falls. It is quite simply the worst top-down driving ever. The car is not controllable. You have these endless tight turns which can only be done at top speed, and the car seems to only take them at some completely random point after you've pressed the corresponding button for the freaking turn. You will not be able to do anything but crash the car a million times over, the only amusement being that it seemingly only takes Dempsey a few minutes to find a brand new car after totaling the last one. There must be some GTA style carjacking going on that we just don't see. Dempsey's quest to seemingly crash every single vehicle in the neighbourhood continues until you find another building you can enter, or more likely, you turn the game off in disgust and throw the tape at the wall. Ocean Software are, of course, kind of known for their times, and even if a few of them actually are pretty good for the time, they were definitely capable of stinkers. And Dennis on the Amiga? Well, this is definitely one of the lamest. It also doubles up as being an absolutely dead-on example of all the worst bits of Euro platforming, with every single negative trope from the subgenre on display. Utterly lame weapon that barely does anything at all? Check. Enemies based on household appliances inexplicably coming alive and hurting you, despite there being literally no supernatural element to Dennis whatsoever? Check. A premise that is barely related to the film it's based on? <laughs> yep. Infuriating left to right to left and so on levels where you spend most of the time dumbly walking around looking to find the one platform you can actually sod and jump on? It's there. Arsing about having to collect every bloody fin and complete some obtuse puzzles before actually being able to finish the damn level? <laughs> Definitely. Every last little thing that people hate about Euro platformers can be found right here in Dennis, and that's plenty enough for the Americanised menace to get into the bottom 100. As much as I hate Dennis, if I was to actually rank this list then he probably wouldn't be too high. We're looking at about 90 or so for him. Dick Tracy on the Amiga, however? Well, this is a different matter. Here you're looking at something I would consider to be right up at the top, or bottom. Number three, number two, hell, some days, maybe even number one. This is the absolutely quintessential kin of the hopeless side-scrollers. It has some of the worst plink-plonk single-channel music around, it has dreadful graphics complete with the jerkiest, most awful movement, it has random enemies all over the shop, and these enemies usually spawn right alongside you at the very edge of the screen just as you're leaving it, causing no end of damage in a game where you get all of one life. It's a bloody flick screen side scroller on the Amiga, which is a cardinal sin in its own right. Something about this game truly brings about an utterly visceral hatred inside of me. Words are not enough to describe it. Oh, by the way, this is also a game by Titus Software, the French studio much more famous for Superman 64. <laughs> Superman 64, eh? It is absolutely nothing compared to Dick Tracy on the Amiga. I can promise you that. It's an awful game on other platforms too. The amazing thing is that I could have easily put the Spectrum version or C64 or any other here, but this is the one that always sticks out the most. If I had a million pounds, 
I would actually buy every copy of this and give it a bath in some cement. That's what this deserves. Anti-drug games from the 1980s are always more than a little bit cringy and awful, but there's perhaps none quite as weird as Drug Watch on the spectrum. Sold by that almighty software powerhouse known as Lee Nottinghamshire Constabulary, what we have here is a Space Invaders clone where you have to say no to lines of pushers who are throwing drugs at you. More accurately, they're throwing the word drug at you and then awkwardly shifting about in the green nothingness when you successfully say no at them. If you get hit with the word drug too many times, naturally you'll die because you've become a complete and utter junkie, smoothing your brain off with a cocktail of crack and skag, terrified of vomiting your daily fix. Aren't you just so happy that you clicked on this video so that you could learn about obscurities like this one? Yes, there is a game based on EastEnders. By this point we've had so many weird licensed tie-ins in the list that one based on EastEnders probably doesn't even raise the eyebrows all that highly, but this one is especially awful. Created by the utterly shithouse software house Maxon, this is another classically incomprehensible bit of code where you play a fellow going around Albert Square, quite literally represented here by a bunch of multicoloured squares, and perform several tasks such as running Kathy's cabs, serving invisible patrons at the Queen Vic, minding Mr Papadopoulos's laundrette, and trying to keep something that's apparently supposed to be a baby quiet. The big question I suppose is, what the bloody hell's happened to all the other residents of the square? Wherefore art thou Wixie, Dirty Den and Pete Beale? Perhaps you've killed a lot of them and you're now using Albert Square as your own personal toy town. I don't really know, and it's not like conjuring up surreal scenarios such as this one makes playing this bloody game any better now, does it? Being that it is Christmas time, it's only right that we have an example of a Christmas game on the list. At least one if not more, because they're usually not good. Elf Bowling 1 and 2 on the DS however, surely has to be the worst of them. It's certainly one of the most scummy cash grabs. Why? Well because this game card consists of two cheap and simple flash games from the late 90s that inexplicably got popular at the time despite being nothing but the most simple versions of 10 pin bowling that you could possibly get. The elves are purposefully annoying so I suppose that people got a bit of satisfaction from chucking a bowling ball at their faces for two minutes, I guess that's why they got a little viral. Anywho, said games which, let's not forget, could be played for free when they were originally made, have been dropped onto this cart and then actually sold for money. On their own, neither of these games would really be bad enough to make a bottom 100 in all honesty, but when delivered in this way, this is an absolute bloody piss take. Ah, back to the world of terrible arcade conversions. The original Eastwatt Arcade just by itself is not exactly the most memorable game, it's a bit like Shinobi mixed with a hefty Robocop influence. But here on the spectrum, good god. This is what can happen when you have a busy studio and a time span of about 5 weeks for one person to port some arcade game from scratch with more than likely zero support from the original creators and you've probably got a whole bunch of other similar projects to do at the same time. This was often the case for poor old Richard Applin, who got the credit for this port. Our poor cop has been drawn in such a way that makes it look like he has no neck, he just looks inhuman. It's all painfully slow, and the sound, I mean, good god the sound. Now the spec he isn't usually known for good sound, but this game was released in 1990 and could do much better. Applin's own thoughts on his conversion are best summed up by him often imploring people to not tell anybody else that he made eSWAT in the wonderful essays of text he hid inside the code of many an arcade port. Here's another miserable title from the Mega Drive, and another case of Sega really dropping the ball. Picture the scene. You've created something amazing with Castle of Illusion, people love it, it's selling your new system, and Disney are very happy with what you've done with their mouse. They're not easy to please either, so well done on that one. What's your next move then? Well obviously you get the license for one of Disney's most treasured films starring Mickey Mouse, Fantasia, and ship it off to European shite-arses infograms, who proceed to fuck the whole thing up by creating an absolute mockery of a platformer with single channel music and controls that are barely functional. 
everybody immediately hates it, and Disney are so utterly pissed off at you over the end product that they very nearly forbid you from making anything related to their company ever again. More than just a bad game, this could have been an utter catastrophe for Sega. Don't farm your prized possessions out to hacks, folks. Talking of which, here's another ridiculous mutilation of an IP. In one sense, creating a game about Fight Club is obvious. I mean, it's got a lot of fighting in it, hasn't it? But of course, in another more reasonable sense, calling Fight Club a film about fighting is a rather gross misunderstanding of what said film is actually about. Couldn't be any more shallow, could it? But someone obviously interpreted the antics of Tyler Durden and Project Mayhem in such a way, and the Fight Club game is the end result. It's not just enough for this to be an incredibly low-grade Tekken ripoff with the typical drab graphics you expect from PS2 shovelware and a shockingly awful story that's told entirely in still screens, the whole thing is so ridiculous and stupid that you can actually unlock Fred Bloody Durst as a hidden character. Because if there's one thing that could have so obviously improved Fight Club as a film, it's Limp Biscuit. My lord. I suppose if there is one saving grace here, it's that you do get to play as Bob and beat people up with your bitch tits. This is not enough to take the game away from the bottom 100, where it utterly belongs. Now, there are actually some quite decent Flintstones games out there, when you think about it. Some fine 8-bit platformers on the NES, a nice 16-bit game on the Mega Drive. They've done okay for the most part. With the exception, of course, of the bloody UK computer game, here once again to ruin the entire day. Grand Slam are the culprits this time, and their idea of a brilliant and involving Flintstones game is to start everything off by having Fred paint the bloody wall of his house. Not a joke, we have suspenseful and hair-raising wall painting action. Move that ladder, get that paint on there, beat the devil out of that brush, stop pebbles from leaving her cot and doodling all over your work. Can you take the pressure? Actually, you probably can't. The controls are so awful and the time limit so tight that you more than likely won't beat this first stage. Painting will defeat you. If you do beat it, you get to go bowling with Barney in a bowling sim even more simplistic than elf bowling, and then play a broken vertical platformer. As with so many of these games, it's just not worth it, is it? Want to see another awful 3D football game? Here you go. And make no mistake, 442 Soccer is definitely one of the worst of them, beating out so many other crap shows from the 32-bit era, even the likes of Chris Kamara's Street Soccer that we've already seen. It might not look too hideous in motion, like a rather naff 3D sensible soccer, but then when you play it, the game's brokenness becomes apparent. The computer is so rubbish you actually don't need to shoot. Nine times out of ten you can happily just sprint the ball into the goal without ever actually passing or shooting or kicking a ball in any way. And the scary thing about this is that this isn't the only game where you can do such a thing. Seriously, we are going to see so many worse games than this before we reach this list's end. <laughs> just wait till you see what's coming in a couple of entries time. For now though, this is completely hopeless. Another baffling title? Eh, why not? This is a bit borderline, seeing as it wasn't sold as a commercial product, but then it's not a bootleg. Glaxo, the pharmaceutical company, did actually commission someone to make a little Amiga game for distribution to their employees. And what's the end result? Possibly the worst hero of them all. George Glaxo suffers a great deal from many allergies, and while he can take medication to help with this, he gradually gets more sick when he comes into contact with animals, especially fluffy birds, playful cats, and cute dogs. Of course, there's one way that you can prevent this from happening. Take out your pop gun and shoot all of these animals dead. So, here you go. This is a game where you play as an apparent hero who gets out of breath and lethargic in two minutes flat and alleviates himself from his malaise by killing cute animals. I have to wonder if Glaxo were particularly pleased with this end product, and now it's long been leaked and is out there for everyone else to enjoy. Or, more accurately, wonder just what the bloody hell went through everybody's mind. 3D football could at times be bad enough on the PlayStation, we've seen that already. But what about a 3D football game that you could play on your Amiga 500? That's certainly ambitious, but that's what Impulse tried to do with Graham Souness Vector Soccer. 
and as you might expect due to the game's presence on this list, they really should not have bothered. I mean, for Christ's sake. Those are actually the 3D models, they don't get any better than that. And nor does the speed of the game. It's easily the slowest football game I've ever played, and I have played a lot of football games. I would have to say that this is the worst 3D attempt at a football game ever, but the scary thing is that I do know footy games that are actually worse than this one, and we will be seeing them. You may not think that it could ever get worse than this, but well, it's kind of my job to dig deeper after all. Oh dear, oh dear. I have done a whole video on the Great Space Race, which is one of the ZX Spectrum's most infamous flops, but I will briefly sum things up here. In the early 80s, you had a studio called Legend who made a hit game called Valhalla. It tried to be a bit cinematic and didn't do too bad a job of it, at least for 1983. 1984's The Great Space Race was Legend's next game, and it was to push the cinematic boundaries even further. A truly interactive experience, available in shops for an at the time astronomically high price of £15. To compare that to modern titles, that would be considerably more even than the recommended price of 70 quid that a lot of studios are trying to push today. At the time, even the biggest Spectrum games were 8 or 9 quid at the most. And, well, what you're seeing on screen is the whole game. The interactive experience come to life. Can you tell the difference between this and, I don't know, the Wrath of Khan? Holy shit. Literally all you can do in this game by the way is make the odd little yes or no choice. Or just not make choices at all and watch the space opera play out by itself. Yeah. This was a complete disaster. And it basically killed Legend Stone dead. Green Beret, otherwise known as the ultra punny Russian attack, is an arcade classic, and it is also a classic at home, great on NES, great on C64, and one of the best ports ever made for the ZX Spectrum. I love this game, but not every port of the game cut the mustard, I'm afraid. What we're seeing here is the version of the game released for the Commodore 16, or Plus 4, and wow, it, it's a mess. There's only one sprite, both you and the enemies look exactly the same. It's flick screen, meaning you're likely going to be killed by enemies appearing at the right edge of the screen when you're just about to reach the next one. Some of the enemies shoot, but unlike the original game and most of the ports, there's no way to discern this until a bullet comes at you at lightning speed and you die. I mean, surely the Commodore 16 could have had a better port of Green Beret than this, right? It's hardly a great machine, but this cannot have been its limit. But if you really want a game that's going to make a computer look weak, well here we are. The worst racing game of them all. Hard driving, as marvellous an arcade as it was, has a whole load of home ports that at best have not exactly aged brilliantly, and at worst are total disasters. I do get a decent kick out of the Mega Drive version, mind. But this one here, on the Commodore 64, this was the most inadvisable. I suppose you could flatly say that this is what happens when you try and run a game like hard driving on such an old computer with no way to use the Commodore's graphics hardware, but even then the end result is shocking. I don't think I have ever played a slower game than this. The controls speak for themselves too. This is a definite case where you can actually see how bad they are on screen because seriously, I'm not intentionally swinging my motor all over the bloody road here. That's just what happens when you do literally anything in the game. For this game to actually be sold in shops is an insult to the poor sods who are still ploughing away on the Commodore in the early 90s. It's so fundamentally broken that it should never ever have come out. I'll say it again, worst racing game ever. And here we have another utterly infamous flop from the microcomputer era. And my word, there is so much to say about Hairraiser. It may look like a bunch of completely random, badly drawn screens with nonsensical text accompanying them, and that's because it is. And yet there's such a story behind it. The almighty Ashens did a whole freaking presentation on why Hairraiser is his personal worst game ever, and I recommend that you check it out. But to sum up the story. In 1983, two assholes cheated their way to winning a prize laid out in the puzzle book Masquerade, said prize being a golden hair pendant worth £30,000. 
they used this notoriety to set up a software company called Hairsoft and release this game, Hairraiser, for £8. Yeah, that's exactly what this minuscule piece of basic code cost. In fact, this is only one half of the puzzle, the prelude. You had to pay another £8 for the second half, the finale, if you wanted to solve the puzzle and win the golden hair in real life. And the finale is basically identical to the first part. In short, you're paying £16 in 1984 money for a bunch of basic screens that could have fit in about 8k of memory, something that could have been in a book that cost a couple of quid, which was the case with the original Masquerade. Nobody ever solved the puzzle, in all likelihood because said puzzle was either completely made up nonsense, or was purposefully made so obtuse as to be virtually impossible, but legally not a scam. Absolutely one of the most disgraceful pieces of software ever made, and even if it's so uninteractive as to pretty much not be a computer game, it simply has to be in this list. Scam. Absolute fucking scam. After an entry that makes me angry, like that last one, it's kind of nice to just go back to a traditionally lame fighting game, and Heavy Nova on the Mega Drive is a good example. This is a classic example of gameplay being completely ignored over presentation. You've got decent music, a nicely done intro, pretty big sprites and all sorts like that. But the game is absolutely bloody rigid, slow as anything, and the fighting system that limits the attacks you do the more you get beat em up only serves to make the game even slower. It may well look nicer than just about any other game in this top 100, but that counts for absolutely nothing whatsoever when playing it is so painful. You should expect by now with this list that even when a really bad 16-bit game gets featured, a similar micro game is going to come along and wipe it out. It wasn't intentional for Heavy Nova to be followed by Highlander on the spectrum, but that's just how it happens. By far the worst game Ocean ever released, Urban Legend had it that Ocean had actually made the game purposefully shit because they'd negotiated a terrible contract with the rights holders of the film and so they tanked the title to make sure that it didn't do well. It's a cute story but the truth is even more depressing. Ocean farmed the game out to Canvas Software, which despite possessing some talented coders and artists, was run by people who absolutely didn't give a fuck about anything except money, and basically encouraged games to be shut out without any care or attention, because they didn't think people like Ocean would notice just how broken and terrible they were. Nigh on unplayable games like Highlander are the result of this practice, and in the end, well, Ocean actually did notice. Once again I've done a whole video about this one, and it's a sadder story than you might think. Anyway, ugh, that's about all you can say. We're halfway through the list, and now here's something new. A brilliant example of a terrible game from Japan, something that gamers over there usually call a kosoge, or literally, shit game. And few games are as awful as Hoshiwomi or Hito for the Famicom, which a lot of people would agree is the worst attempt at an RPG ever made. The standard of the graphics is beyond the pale, of course. The towns are actually invisible in this game, meaning you don't know where they are until you just so happen to step on the tile containing one. It's virtually impossible to get anywhere. In all likelihood, a monster is going to kill you outright pretty sharpish, seeing as you can barely do any damage to them, and they can do tons to you. And this is the sort of game where levelling up takes absolutely ages. And from a technical point of view, Look, these bloody guys couldn't even give you a second digit so that you can actually fully see your hit points. You just get two, or one, or more often than not, zero instead. As with a lot of these kasoges, Hoshiwa Mirohito is such a hilarious joke of a game that more than a few people have dedicated themselves to figuring its mysteries. Honestly, it's amazing to think that it's not just some ridiculous Takeshi's Challenge-esque parody made by someone who utterly despised RPGs. Tear techs. I knew you'd come eventually. This list would be incomplete without one of the UK software world's most notorious hack companies, infamous for the terrible games they made for the likes of US Gold back in the 80s and 90s. At least they weren't purposefully making garbage like Canvas were, I suppose, but my lord their games were shite. Human Killing Machine is one of their most legendary examples. 
What we have here is actually a sequel of sorts to their already horrible port of the original Street Fighter to computers, being that it uses the same engine. But the game here is even worse. You have one of the most laughable crews of fighting game stereotype characters ever assembled, vociferously unappealing graphics, and fighting that weirdly feels even more broken than the previous Street Fighter port despite being largely the same bloody game. Needless to say, this is a game that UK retro gamers take the piss out of incessantly. And yes, it is possible to clickbait coverage of it a little by calling it the terrible Street Fighter title that you never knew existed. Unlike other platforms like the Spectrum and Amstrad, the Commodore 64 could lay claim to worldwide popularity. It is the biggest selling single model of computer ever made, of course. Because of this, it's not all that uncommon to get multiple ports of an arcade game on the system, one for Europe, another for the States. And well, this is the American port of Ikari Warriors. I really don't need to tell you how pathetic it looks, as it pretty clearly looks as though it's been knocked together in basic, complete with hopeless single channel music. The punchline here is that the UK port of Ikari Warriors, done by Elite, is one of the absolute greatest and most authentic arcade ports you can find on the whole computer. An amazing experience, so far removed from this absolute pile. It's amazing to see such a direct example of two teams with the same task coming up with such wildly different attempts at a port. You would think that there'd be some similarity somewhere, but there absolutely isn't. The same game gets one of the best computer ports of all time, and one of the worst on the exact same system. Incredible. We're sticking with the C64 though for a game that's even worse. Indeed, this is another one that would be right down there, potentially fighting for that number one spot. Intergalactic Cage Match. If you were ever to play some sort of bad retro game top trumps, well if anyone draws this card then quite frankly it's all over. I would call this, with only one solitary exception that we will get to in due course, the single most broken and useless game on all of the 8-bit micros. I'm sure that purely on the surface this game looks awful to you, and even for a budget title it's a complete rip-off, but there is so much more. How about the animations that actually completely break the freaking characters? Sometimes they just randomly appear to be in pieces. How amazing for something like that to get through! And that's not all. What's even better is that if you're playing against the computer, you can literally just hold left to climb up the cage and win at the start of every match. The game is so bugged that the computer is not able to get you off the cage once you start climbing it. Who the hell would code something like this? And more importantly, what kind of publisher would actually release the bloody thing instead of chucking it into an incinerator? Mastertronic, that's who. Dear audience, I give you the worst game in the entire glorious history of the Commodore 64. Jeez, just the title International Ninja Rabbits is enough to make me shudder a little bit. It's like something you put together with a dartboard. Ninjas are a cheap way to sell a computer game, cute animals are another cheap way to sell a game. So let's put the two together. And this side scrolling beat em up is the result. The Amiga version especially is hilarious. Not only do you get to seemingly kick the likes of the late great Diego Maradona in the face, but they'll also literally stand stock still until you get close to them so the fight can begin. You can even get into a position where it so clearly looks like you should be hitting them, and yet you cannot. It's so bloody hard to fight anyone without taking damage, meaning that even if this is a woeful experience, it's at the very least not likely to last all that long. And now we get to the absolute bastardization of an icon. That's what this list's all about. The original Jet Set Willy on the Spectrum is a classic, of course, one of the system's most famous games, even if it was a fair bit broken in many ways. These issues were sorted out in the original Jet Set Willy 2 on Specky, along with the addition of several new areas, and that's very good as well. But then, well, there's this rather inadvisable Amiga version. It's fair to say that the new 16-bit minor willy lacks any of the charm the original lo-fi sprite had, and the switching of the game from a flick screen title to a scroller makes everything look so utterly haphazard. It really does look like something that's been chucked together almost at random. Seriously, 
One can almost imagine Matthew Smith, the original's creator, looking down on this like Don Corleone looks over the body of Sonny in The Godfather, weeping over the mess they've made of his boy. Chances are he might have been too busy partying to actually do such a thing, but it's still a funny scene to think about. Bloody tear techs are back again. What we have here is interesting. The original Strider was a big hit everywhere of course, and rightly so because it's an all time classic. The Mega Drive version in particular is legendary. Alas, Tiertex handled the computer ports of the game, and they aren't any good. After that they did a microcomputer only sequel called Strider 2, which isn't particularly amazing, but it's better than the computer ports of Strider. It's a bit more plain and plays more to the strengths of the Specky and other platforms. But then this gets ported to the Mega Drive with just about nothing changed by the presentation. And my word, it does not fit on here at all. Imagine the complete disappointment of going from the original Strider on Mega Drive to this thoroughly moribund title. The real kicker is that this 16-bit version doesn't even run as well as the micro versions. It is chock full of glitches and slowdown. You don't even get to enjoy the rather odd sight of our hero turning into a robot like you do in the micro versions. This then is the strange case of a game actually being far worse when converted to a more powerful platform, and I bloody hate it. Uh, this one's a frustrating entry. The annoying thing about Kageki on the Mega Drive is that it has some cool things going for it. The original arcade isn't that bad, and I'm actually a sucker for the oh so very Japanese art style that the game employs. But here in the home, my god, this game is utterly empty. You have two attacks, punch or punch a bit harder. All the enemies are so dumb that it's easy to avoid them so long as you press both buttons for the dodge and they'll usually walk at you in a straight line, making it incredibly easy to punch them to death in record time. And so this is a thoroughly simplistic and totally joyless experience in the end. Its only purpose really is if you feel the need to complete a game and get some much needed serotonin from the act of beating something although the boredom of simply pressing C and little else for half an hour to actually do it probably outweighs the gratification. Ugh, for God's sake US Gold. How does something like this come out? Why would you let anyone bugger a game like Kung Fu Master up this badly? How do you do it? It's a dead simple game. You walk forward, you kick people in the head, and it's fun. That's it. I absolutely refuse to believe that this is the best the Spectrum could do in this department. In fact, I bloody well know it isn't. Why is it so slow? Why is the colour clash so hideous, even more than usual to the point where everything's a twitching, flickering mess? What in the living hell is this bee-chewing beeper music that the game subjected me to? Back in the days of playground wars between Specky and C64 fans, I find it hard to imagine a poor Specky fan having an answer to any pompous Commodore follower bringing up something like Kung Fu Master. Aside from going to a well like Bionic Granny and the whole thing descending into an argument over which system's games are more shit. This is a travesty. Get ready folks, Last Action Hero is not only here, but it's going to be here twice. The tie-in games for this strange film were so terrible that two of them have made it into the bottom 100. And this Amiga one here? Well you know how I said that Bebby's Kids isn't the worst arcade beat em up ever? Well as you can clearly see, it's not, because this most definitely is. One saving grace is that it's utterly hilarious. Not only does our hero look virtually nothing like Arnie, but his moves are the stupidest ever seen in any beat em up. He can defeat opponents by repeatedly backflipping in place, doing roundhouse kicks, which obviously you've seen Arnie do all the time, or quite literally head banning. You just hold the button and a direction down, and these moves repeat over and over again, and they never get old. I'm sure the enemies in the game are having a good laugh too, because the attacks are all uniformly worthless and will not stop the game's thugs from giving you a jolly good kick in no matter what you do. Arnold has never had the best luck with tie-in games, but he has quite possibly never looked as pathetic as he did here, in the Amiga Last Action Hero. Mind you, the Mega Drive and SNES game comes pretty close. This side-scroller is also an absolute pile. Now at this point it's probably a good idea to relay the main thing that utterly scuppered all these games, according to industry vets like Shahid Kamal Ahmed who worked on it. 
Sony had a much more elaborate plan for the Last Action Hero games, but they were wrecked at the 11th hour by an executive order from the Austrian Oak. He didn't want to be shown firing guns in any of the games because he wanted to clean up this image. Now this is Arnold bloody Uzi 9mm Schwarzenegger we're talking about here, mind you. You know, the Terminator, who likes to carry around a massive bloody minigun. And in the chaos that followed, games like this bad scroller featuring an emaciated looking Arnie who can do absolutely nothing except punch and kick are the hopeless end result. It seems like the governator had a bit of a change of heart in the end. His next tie-in game for True Lies features him blasting people to kingdom come. That probably wasn't any comfort for the poor sods who made this sorry mountain of cack. Right, buckle up. It's time for the Little Britain game. Another one of the very worst out there. The very thought of a Little Britain game is bad enough. Generally speaking, no good can come of any game based on a comedy series, let alone the series that represents the most miserable aspects of the mid-2000s in all of its smug, punching down, low-rent glory. But it is fitting that a show I consider to be one of my very least favourites of all time gets the utterly horrific game it deserves. Once again, we have a bunch of minigames, all of which are absolutely disastrous. We've got Andy doing some diving while Lou's not looking, Vicky Pollard going skating, the fat fighters woman in some absolute shit-ass Pac-Man type thing, and plenty more grotesque horrors. Because of the dreadful times we were living in and the fact that you couldn't escape this ghastly show back in the day, obviously the game sold well, meaning that you can find copies of it smeared all over every second-hand shop in the land. And now, well, just about everyone will happily tell you that it's the worst PS2 game of them all. They are all, without question, absolutely right. Even the surreal horror of Animal Soccer World still can't hold a candle to this game. Beyond it simply being one of the most incompetent efforts at a video game ever committed to three dimensions, I hate it and every single sneering scumbag Middle Englander laughing at everyone who is different to you Finn that this fucking pile of shit stands for. The best way to describe London Cab Challenge on the PS2 is to use a well-worn and quite amusing meme. Mum, can we have Crazy Taxi? We have Crazy Taxi at home. And this is, of course, Crazy Taxi at home. Another absolutely hopeless effort from Phoenix Games, this is as cheap and nasty as you can get from a ripoff of Crazy Taxi. The only real hilarity to be found comes from crashing into all the other cars, and it's not like you're going to be able to avoid doing that because the controls are absolutely hat stand. It feels like whoever made this didn't even really touch the game's inspiration. They might have been told one night about Crazy Taxi in a pub by some utterly newscasted co-worker, and then they made the game over a weekend based on the drunkard's recollection. It's a budget title in every possible form. Not only was it sold on the cheap, but I refuse to believe that any more than five pence was dedicated to the game's production. Comedically awful. Another entry from the land of Kosoge now, and Lost World of Jenny is another one of my favourites in the category. With all the tons of titles that came out for the Famicom back in the day, sometimes one would creep through that makes the average LJN title shine by comparison. Lost World of Jenny is a good summation of the average Kosoge level platformer. Why is it that your hero is almost always completely useless and incapable of hurting anything or anyone? Who the bloody hell did this music? Why do the graphics look so completely chucked up together at the last minute as if they'd actually been forgotten about completely until days before the game's release? Kosoge's like Jenny feel somewhat different to the average western bad game. Much like Hoshiwa Mirohito, it almost feels like certain Japanese coders were in a secret competition with each other to create the most incompetently made game that they could, because they're so dreadful. And we're still yet to encounter the grand champion in this category. But hey, it's not as if there isn't plenty of bad western platform games on this list too. Mohawk and Headphone Jack certainly right down there. This is kind of borderline, but the reason why this one gets in is due to the endless habit of developers on the SNES to overuse Mode 7. Ooh, look at all the scaling and rotation we can do! 
This game here is by far the worst offender, using so much of it in the gameplay that it can be actively unpleasant to play, flying around so unreasonably fast and shifting so much. If you suffer from any kind of motion sickness, I would not bloody touch this at all. And to top it off, it's all in service of a bloody European style collecting all the sodden fins platformer filled with cringy mid 90s dude dude. That alone isn't enough to make this game stand out, but the feeling of actual queasiness that comes with playing the sodden fin? Yeah, that'll do it. I don't even get motion sickness, and I cannot stand to play this pile for any more than 5 minutes. Which I suppose, in a way, is a good thing. It's always good to go back to what I suppose is my home court, a properly crap 80s micro game with a story behind it. Mutations is pretty bad, of course. What you have here is a space shooter that's a bit Space Invaders ish, only done in a. something that tries to be 3D but most definitely isn't. It's not exactly great on its own, but it's on the list because this is one of many Specker games that were made by the infamous Harry S. Price. Now I hope you got the quotations on made there. Harry Price's whole shtick was to take previously released games and completely rip them off, essentially making the same game under a different name and selling it to another software house, in this instance Tinesoft. Mutations here is, in actual fact, Spawn of Evil, a 1983 game by Don Priestley. This is one of the more infamous Harry Price ripoffs, probably because it also came with the equally terrible One for the Road, which is another game he nicked from elsewhere. He did this a lot, and was only really caught out by magazines a couple of times. So yeah, purely on principle, one example of his shit ass business practices just had to be in the bottom 100. And there really were so many knackers like Harry Price operating on micros back in the day. It's another entry in the utterly baffling games based on soap opera's subgenre. And <laughs> look, I don't know how this could possibly be justified. Why on earth would you take Neighbours, the Australian soap opera, and use that license to make a bad isometric racing game? More to the point, why would you make a game based on Neighbours at all? What's the thought process here? I mean, I can kind of guess what happened. The makers of this game had some budget isometric racer that was already in the works, and one day the boss bursts in and shouts, We've struck gold, fellas! We've got the license for Neighbours! People smile awkwardly and give befuddled looks at each other, and said isometric racer is immediately switched up to ham-fistedly include characters and elements from the show. Lord only knows why there's some sort of karting competition in Ramsey Street where everyone's trying to stop Charlene and company from actually getting anywhere, but here we are. Neighbours the computer game, just what everyone always secretly wanted but for some reason never actually asked for. Here's something strange, while Ninja Gaiden is available on most platforms, they're almost all conversions of the rather middling arcade beat-em-up, not the legendary NES title. But there is one out there, an Amiga conversion, released in the States only, of the NES's Ninja Gaiden 2. I find it especially odd because to my knowledge there isn't an Amiga port of the first NES Gaiden, so this kind of just exists on its own, and it's one of the worst conversions I've ever seen. You won't believe how you pull off attacks, you actually use the up diagonals on your joystick to swin Hayabusa's sword. While Amiga games generally only have one button to play with and that's used to jump here, using up right or up left to attack is absolutely ridiculous. And again, it feels like this port was done from some vague memory of playing the game. They can't even get the bloody colour of Ryu Hayabusa's ninja suit right, let alone everything else that's just completely wrong. Who in their right mind wanted this at all? The very thought of this existed actually hurts my brain! Oh jeez, more ninja nonsense. Seriously, how many bad games were released back in the day with Ninja tacked onto it? I couldn't even bloody find space in this list for Ninja Scooter Simulator, which you may think is a game that I've literally just made up, but <laughs> no it isn't. Ninja Master just about edges that game out though. What we have here is a ninja game that's also like your typical athletics game. Welcome to the Ninja Olympics, where you must compete in events such as breaking blocks and deflecting arrows with your sword. It's another outrageous microcomputer affair, and as a game, it's hopeless. 
Most of the events are highly frustrating, there's way too many controls for how straightforward the events actually are, and they barely work in any case. This is sillier even than Ninja Golf on the Atari 7800, and that's frankly saying a hell of a lot. Next up we have a game that should have been known as Peter Shilton's Football. However, being that it was released just after the 1986 World Cup, the title was changed at the last minute to the utterly cringy blatant cash grab Peter Shilton's Handball Maradona as an attempt to get some money from the late great Argentinian's Hand of God goal. Anywho, the game we have here is actually quite unique. It's the only football game I can think of, from back in the day, where you exclusively play as the goalkeeper. That actually could be a very interesting concept. Unfortunately this game falters because it's really slow, there's only a few situations that the game just cycles through again and again, and eventually you've seen them all. The same shots repeat over and over and it very quickly becomes absolutely mind numbing. Be a pro goalkeeper mode this most decidedly is not, and the hall of shame worthy title, well, that's enough for it to get a slot in the bottom 100. Naturally this list needs a little bit of pit fighter. At least most would think so. However, the arcade itself isn't all that bad, it's a bit of a guilty pleasure. The ports, however, are another story. And there is no doubt about the worst ports of them all. THQ were responsible for the SNES and the Game Boy versions, and they are the absolute shits. In fact, I would go so far as to call Pit Fighter the worst SNES game of them all, and the worst Game Boy of them all. How so? Because this is a complete joke. The game expects you to get through Pit Fighter with all of one life, the controls don't even bloody use all of the SNES's face buttons, you can cheese the game just about entirely with one attack that breaks the AI, and if you don't know how to do that, well the game's probably going to beat you in about a minute. The Game Boy version is exactly the same as the SNES version, only with less colour, hence why they are both on here. If this were a micro game, it would be terrible enough, and believe me, there's some wretched ports of Pit Fighter to be found on the likes of the Spectrum. But this is a SNES cartridge, something that I presume would cost pretty close to 50 quid in the shops. Now if you keep that in mind, then this horrid port of Pit Fighter becomes an absolute fucking outrage. One of the biggest rip-off games in the list that has literal out and out scammers on it. This would very easily make my bottom 10, if not my bottom 5. You really didn't think that Awesome Possum was going to be the cringiest eco-friendly game that I could find now, did you? As ever, there's always something much worse lurking in a darkened corner. Presenting Rainbow Warrior, the official Greenpeace game for the Amiga. It's another bunch of mini-games, as is so often the case with these awful titles, and they're all based around helping an environmental cause. Perhaps you're stopping some assholes from dumping waste at sea, or you're preventing baby seals from getting clubbed for their blubber, or you're playing a dolphin who's trying to stop the ocean from being polluted. All very worthy causes. But the quality of the game here? Uh, that might just obscure the message a little bit. If there was any QA or any testing at all on this title, and I highly doubt there was, then presumably it was all ignored. Even just here in the frankly hilarious seal clubbing game, you can see for yourself how wrecked this game is. It's so hard to just make a bloody jump from one platform to another, if you are not dead centre, you're gonna fall off. This is the most amusing game, but the rest aren't any better either. Deary me. This is one game that's gonna leave you with a serious Greta Thunberg how dare you type scowl. If this is the best game that those who have dedicated themselves to saving the planet can get, <laughs> well I'd be massively fucked off too. Here's another really quite awful computer only arcade sequel for your entertainment. The original Renegade got some thoroughly brilliant ports to the computers and they were massive hits. This resulted in Ocean producing the first computer sequel to the game, Target Renegade. And guess what? That was also brilliant, and also a massive hit. But then came Renegade 3, the final chapter. In their infinite wisdom, Ocean decided that the best place our hero could go next was… um, back in time. We've gone from knocking down thugs in the back streets, to beating up dinosaurs and Captain Caveman, oh sorry, Captain Caveman lookalikes in prehistoric times. It's quite the change in direction, 
and the result is an absolute disaster. This game takes away everything, and I do mean everything, that made the first two games so good. It runs on a totally new engine which is, unbelievably, far worse. It moves like a pig, the sprites have almost no animation, and it is so prone to bugs and glitches. Hell, you can just stay at the bottom of the screen and crouch punch when you have to beat all the gangs of enemies. They aren't actually able to kill you when you do. The music is good at least, but yeah, that doesn't save it. An utter disaster. Thank god it was the final chapter, cause lord only knows what Ocean would have come up with next. It's another SNES game from the brilliant minds at Rare Systems, and this one's somehow even cringier a title than Captain Novelin. Here's Rex Ronan Experimental Surgeon, a game all about the dangers of smoking. Play as Rex Ronan as he attempts to save the life of a tobacco executive by shrinking and treating him from the insides, despite the efforts of the tobacco companies to stop him from waking up and exposing the fact that cigarettes are actually bad for you. The premise is hilarious, of course, but the game is an absolute botch. One thing that tickles me is the first level. You, Rex Ronan, have to clean the person's teeth. Yeah. Having spent an unthinkable amount of money on this technology needed to shrink Rex Ronan to nano size and save this dying man, what do we do? Should we go straight to the lungs or the heart or the arteries or any place where the serious issues might lay? <laughs> nah, sod that. We're gonna clean his bloody teeth. This fellow on life support's gotta have shiny white molars, you know. <laughs> Needless to say, the act of actually cleaning up this guy's buggered body couldn't be more tedious. It sure says a lot when the best part of the game is deciding whether some statement about smoking is either true or false. And by the way, we could have easily included Bronchi the Bronchosaurus or Packy and Marlin here too, because they are also dreadful. But no, we have to draw a line somewhere, and two Rare Systems games are, quite frankly, more than enough. Rise of the Robots, obvious as it is, was always going to be here. It's one of the UK's most shameful games. One of the biggest ever hype jobs, with all those bloody pictures in magazines going back years hyping up some glorious new future that it represented, only for this broken beat-em-up to be the end result. And let's not forget the ridiculous paid-for exclusive reviews. The UK's most popular multi-platform mag, CVG, gave Rise of the Robots 92% which was higher than a certain game they reviewed in the same month called Doom 2. Anyway, here's something a little different. The worst version of an already terrible game, Rise of the Robots on Game Gear. There's some technical goodness here in that we've got the videos and so on from the original, but the game, my god, the game. It's actually more broken than normal, which is kind of hard to believe. And as with all things Rise of the Robots, it feels like an absolutely tremendous waste of time. Funny story, I've actually met the man responsible for this port, no less a figure than Spectrum legend Clive Townsend. Not long after I scorched this version of the game in a video that I did all about Rise, I bumped into him at an expo and he told me that he'd done the port. Now thankfully it wasn't exactly something he was proud of, seeing as he had all of about a month to do the bloody thing in, so you know he didn't shout at me or kick my head in or anything like that. Believe it or not, we're back with Titus again. Titus's record with Tynes is um, not the best to put it blindly, but here's an awful one that actually came years after Superman 64. I give you Robocop for the PS2, which is yet another genre leader in this list, one of the most pathetic attempts at an FPS that has ever been made. Many things are abysmal here. Poor Murphy's movement here is so utterly slow and ponderous that you could make a cup of tea in the time it takes him to turn a corner. The legendary Auto 9, that awesome freaking hand cannon which is such a memorable part of Robo's character, has been turned into the most pathetic pea shooter imaginable. It barely even fires. But the cringiest part of all? That would be Robocop's speech samples. Most likely done by some coder doing a goofy impression who's then had their voice treated, they, no word of a lie, consist of a whole bunch of cornball puns and a rather enthusiastic, OH YEAH, from Robocop. Yeah. Somehow I don't think Tita's software really managed to capture the gist of the movie or the character with this one. And annoyingly, we're still not quite done with them. 
There's another Titus horror in the list, and it's a curveball, but you're going to have to stick around for it. Oh no, poor Arnold just can't catch a break, can he? Damn near every major Schwarzenegger film had some game or other, especially after a certain time, and most of them weren't any good, to be honest. But there's three that really got the shitty end of the stick above all others. We've already seen Last Action Hero, and now we've got The Running Man. This one's a bit more obscure, seeing as it only appeared on the microcomputers courtesy of the generally piss-poor Grand Slam, and it's a case of a flashy intro hide in an absolutely miserable game. Once again, the Amiga version is actually the worst. Ben Richards is useless. The only thing he can do is boot people or dogs up the arse, and he can barely even make a jump to a higher platform. Having to make a sequence of jumps? Haha, <laughs> forget it. You'll be lucky if you can even get to see Sub-Zero, in all honesty. This is most certainly not a game that hits the spot. Eh, what the hell. Let's have another Christmas game. Santa Claus Saves the Earth isn't necessarily as miserable and as craven a money grab as Elf Bowling on the DS is, but it's a pretty good example of the endless, dull and utterly grating Christmas themed platformers that came out back in the 16-bit era. The Days Before Christmases, the Santa's Christmas Capers, all that lot. The only weird thing is that due to what I can only presume was some scheduling error, this game actually came out for the PlayStation 1 in 2002, and not for the Amiga 1200 in 1994. Why even bother with making such games at this time? The received wisdom is that you can knock out games like this in no time at all, and then sell them for very cheap and make a quick buck, but did anyone actually buy this? I mean a lot of people have talked about the game before now, so presumably it must have been purchased somewhere, but... Jeez, even for Christmas games, this is such a lazy and boring slouch. The only real reaction I imagine this game ever getting was from a kid desperately trying to hide a scowl upon finding this bloody thing in their Christmas stocking instead of, I don't know, GTA Vice City or whatever. Hey look, it's the game from which I got my avatar from. Slaughter Sport, aka Ton of the Fat Man, aka Mondu's Fight Palace, started out life on computers like the C64 where, well it was pretty much a typical computer fighting game of the time. Not exactly all that great or even good, but then it's not necessarily the platform of choice for such games and this was in the days well before Street Fighter 2. But as we've already seen, old computer games can find themselves surprisingly resurrected on a Mega Drive, and when this game came out on Sega, oh I'm afraid it's just one of the worst. Nothing works about it. You only get to play as one boring bloody karate guy instead of any of the more exotic monsters and the like who are on display. Trying to throw even basic moves is a chore where you have to hold the button down for dear life rather than just pressing it normally. The music is hilarious and fights consist of little except jumping around. It's something of a challenge to even bloody turn around and face your enemy. As memorable a design as Mondu Le Fat is, uh, he deserved so much better. The best place for this game would be directly inside his big fat belly mouth. Of all the games in the bottom 100, it's hard to argue that any of them are less competent than the one that we're looking at right here, Squidge for the ZX Spectrum, the game that most people would say is the very worst released for the UK's legendary machine. The one where you control a massive bird that moves at way less than one frame every second. That's bad enough, maybe worse than anything we've seen so far. But the real kicker with this game, a title that was absolutely commercially released by the way, is that it is completely unplayable out of the case. And I don't just mean that the controls are really bad, I mean that the game is actually not playable at all. In order to play this game that was quite literally coded by a teenager over the course of a single weekend, you essentially have to hack it and insert a single line poke so that the bloody bird is in any way controllable at all. No other game in the 100 can top that, and that is quite simply a fact. Gradually more and more people have become aware of this one. Ashens has it in one of his awesome books, I've made a video on it, a Chinese creator ripped my video off and introduced the game to people over there, there's a nice Eurogamer article on the whole thing. Is it the worst game ever released? Well the thing about Squidge is that unlike a lot of the others where opinion does have a fair bit to do with matters, this actually does have more of a technical case than any other for being the very worst in the top 100.
or Bomb 100 rather. You can play as Hulk Hogan in many a wrestling game, of course, either officially or unofficially. A facsimile of him is even in Bloody Intergalactic Cage Match, but only a couple of times could you play as him in a game based on one of his films or TV shows, and there's no more hilarious way to play as the Hulkster than to play the game based on Suburban Commando for the Amiga. It's another game by the brilliant folks at Alternative, who've also given us the likes of Allo Allo, Count Duckula 2 and BMX Ninja up to this point. You get to control an incredibly slippy Shep Ramsey in a game based on the film where he ends up trapped in Middletown American suburbia. To go from Scridge to something like this game may make Suburban Commander appear a lot better than it actually is, but rest assured that in any other context this game is kind of an embarrassment. But if you ever wanted to experience the hilarity of the almighty Orange Goblin humiliated and transported to the world of hackjob European platformers, well, here you go. It happened, and we as a people are better for its existence. We are really hitting the business end of the list now that we're in the S's. It's nothing but back-to-back -back heavyweights right now. Next up is Supergran for the Spectrum. It's the last appearance for the almighty Timesoft, but it may just be the worst one yet. Again, you have to get over the existence of a game based on the show where an octogenarian granny obtains special powers and is thrust into saving the world, or at least the town she's in, from the machinations of the evil Scunner Campbell and company. But after that you have to contend with the game itself. The music's probably the first thing that hits you because it's one of the worst beeper creations of the lot, acutely painful to listen to. And like so many Timesoft titles, it can't stick to one form of gameplay. There's flying in a gyrocopter and shooting busters down, flying left and picking up fuel, driving along, platforming… of course all of them are terrible. At no point does the game show anything that's even remotely approaching competence. It completely stinks at every step, and as such it's a fine way for Timesoft to sign off from this list. They're such a fun bunch of lads that I don't even really want to paint them as one of the worst game companies ever, for there are many that I dislike far more, but bloody hell lads. Here we are then, the undisputed kin of Kasogi, the legendary shit game as they call it. No game on the Famicom, or indeed the NES, can even come close to it. They all wilt away in comparison. Nothing is on the level of Super Monkey Diborkin. It stands utterly on its own. Based on the legendary Journey to the West stories, you just, well, control Son Goku and company through the land that seemingly changes colour every time you look at it. Every so often you'll get into a random battle and you won't have a clue what to do, but if you press the buttons haphazardly you'll probably make it through them. And then the weird journey will just continue in this world that looks like it was made by a five year old. If you can figure out just what the hell you actually have to do, then you are a better person than many others. This has stumped many. The folks at legendary Japanese show Game Center CX, players of many a Kasoge, stretched out Super Monkey Daiboken over the course of one whole season in order to try and defeat it. And even then, well, they just couldn't, no matter what. It feels more like a piece of modern art than a computer game. Playing it just strikes you completely off balance, like someone's just whacked you right in the ear. It's just incredible. I said before that almost more than any other type of game, Kosorge's feel like an actual piss take and an attempt to be as hilariously awful as possible. Now that is most certainly not the case, it just feels that way. But this, there's no beat in it. After Super Monkey Die Boken, Every other maker of Kasoge simply had to accept second place. However, we here in the UK can be a great deal worse. Things are a bit grey here, so sometimes our shit games can have a darker edge. So here's Super Trolley, a game where you play as a minimum wage supermarket employee and you, well you just get your bloody head down and do your job. You stack shelves, you clean up tins of beans that have been knocked over, you tag stock and clean up piss left behind by a stray dog. These are all things you do over the course of the game, which by the way takes many hours to actually complete. Everything about it is grey and hopeless. The clearly miserable dog's body that you control, the wizened old hags that get in your way, just the general feel of it all. Video games were not meant for this. 
They were not meant to be used for a simulation like this that so accurately conveys the sense of miserable dead-end job drudgery. And the real kicker? Some bright-eyed child had the idea for this game, probably not realising just what they'd done, and then they got Jimmy Savile, yes, that Jimmy Savile, to fix it for Mastertronic to create the game for his telly show. I'm sure that the shell suit wearing clunk click horror man pedo smiled at having a hand in such a legitimately horrifying creation. What, you didn't think Superman was going to be here after all I've said? Of course he's here. He's the superhero who so often utterly gets screwed by games after all. The Man of Steel doesn't catch a break. However, this is a curveball. It is a Superman game, and it is by Titus, and it's not Superman 64. It's Superman for the Game Boy, and I actually believe this game to be worse than the more famous N64 Rin Flynathon. This is another atrocious side-scroller from the studio who really had a knack for this sort of thing, and instead of flying through Rins, you have to collect keys in the various levels. Because as everyone knows, Superman and keys go hand in hand, and he'd never be able to just bash through or melt a locked door or anything like that. I mean, who do you think he is? Superman? <laughs> Wait. Anyway, the flying here, believe it or not, is actually less controllable than the flying in the N64 game. You just go up and down all over the blame place, you can never get into a straight line, and there's scarcely any animation. It's horrendous, it really is. There's lots of stories from ex Tita spods about how much DC interfered in Superman 64 and helped make it the disaster that it became, and I do totally believe those stories, but I have no confidence that what they were making was actually any good because, well... I hate to be harsh, but it's Tita software, and they were bloody awful. Simple as that. Ultra silly, so bad it's funny 90s kids movie Surf Ninjas has a strong video game connection. A Game Gear takes centre stage at one point in the film, and there was a Game Gear game based on said film. Still, that's not actually all that bad a game, believe it or not. However, on the computers, I'm afraid that Capstone got hold of it and so naturally it stinks. But as if that's not bad enough, said capstone game was ported to the Amiga by Flare Software, who we've already seen in action thanks to the likes of Dangerous Streets and International Ninja Rabbits. The cocktail of crap is so potent here, you get something as weird as it is awful. Instead of actually playing as anyone from the film, you play as this big muscle guy who looks more like Arnold Schwarzenegger than a teenager. The game itself is a miserable load of squirty side-scrolling puzzling, of course, but Flare Software have added quite a lot of their own touches to it. The odd swear word, references to their early games, the ability to rip someone's heart and lungs out of their body. And no, I didn't make that last one up. You can do that in this game, based off a kid's movie, that was commercially released. No one picked up on it at all. It wasn't in Capstone's original game, that was for sure. I don't think Flair were taking this license particularly seriously, you know. One has to imagine just what the state of play was in the offices at Flair for this game to actually exist. I mean, just what in the bloody hell was going on over there? Anyway, how about another little crowd pleaser? And again, Arnie just can't do anything right in the world of video games. While we do have one LJN game to come on this list, for me a lot of the absolute worst tie-in games on the NES didn't actually have the dreaded rainbow on them. Total Recall here is actually an acclaim and interplay affair. And, well, it's another disaster for Arnold. Now he's both extremely stocky and, for some completely unknown reason, ginger. He may find himself pulled into an alley to find himself in punch-ups with equally stocky men with beards, he may have to endure some quite uncontrollable jumping around to try and get some bloody item, he'll be attacked from a place that can only be described as a glory hole, and he'll even have his entire skeleton on show for all to see as enemies happily fly around and blast him to oblivion. It's funny, the game doesn't do a bad job graphically of recreating that x-ray scene from the movie, but everything about the gameplay here is rotten. Thankfully for Big Arn, this is the last time that we'll be seeing him on the list. He's really got it in the bloody neck here, hasn't he? You might even feel a little sorry for him. Time for another terrible micro game with a weird story. And this time it's Track and Field. Yes, a conversion of the legendary athletics game for Spectrum. You may well wonder how Ocean managed to screw this game up when it's little more than joystick waggling and button mashing, and weirdly the answer is that they sort of didn't. 
In case you're not familiar, one of their biggest hits early on was Daily Thompson's Decathlon, a brilliant and totally unofficial track and field style game. One presumes that when they actually set up more of a relationship with Konami later on, Konami insisted that they actually produce an official track and field game, as some sort of payment for getting over with what was essentially a copy. Besides, they did also release an excellent conversion of Hypersports, track and field sequel. And so Ocean made it. It was only released as part of a compilation, on the last side of the last tape, and was clearly knocked together in world record time. The result is so basic it's hilarious. Nothing like the original at all, the events as simple as can be, and so broken that the game actually crashes to basic once you're finished instead of giving you any sort of victory or even a game over screen. So yeah, there's your track and field Konami. It may be broken as all hell, but it met Ocean's end of the bargain. As you might expect, stories behind terrible games like this one are absolute manna from heaven for me. This, I suppose, is another at-home game. The kid wants Grand Theft Auto this time, but unfortunately Grand Theft Auto's already at home. Triggerman is a great contender for being the very lamest third-person action game on PS2, which is really no mean feat because there's an absolute ton of these games on the platform. A dank, miserable budget effort from Crave where sheer frustration is used as an alternative to actually making something that will keep a player satisfied for any length of time. You have utterly basic levels where you're purposefully given almost no pickups, clunky absolutely bloody everything, and schoolboy level enemies. Few games outside of the Phoenix Kingdom scream budget title as much as Triggerman does, and even if that's not necessarily an automatic negative, good god this is insipid. It's like this, you've got GTA at the top, then you've got all the various followers behind, everything from true crime to Scarface, The Godfather and so on. Right at the bottom you've got the major duds, Driver Free, Sopranos Road to Respect and all that. This game right here? It's the level beyond that, the B-Tech version of Sopranos Road to Respect. That about sums it up. Well, how's about another bad fighting game? Here's some Ultraman. This game was pretty terrible on SNES too, but here I've gone for the even more awful Mega Drive version which only came out in Japan. While there are a few perfectly okay ways to play as Ultraman dotted around the video game landscape, this is one of the most irritating fighting games of them all. Why? Well, you can only win a fight by waiting for your beam to charge up to the maximum so that you can fire off your Specium beam, and it only wins a fight when your opponent has zero health. Their health very quickly recharges, and if they've got even the slightest scintilla of health left, the Specium Beam will not kill them, and you'll have to wait another minute or so for it to charge. Does the enemy have to do anything like that to beat you? <laughs> of course it bloody doesn't. What a maddening, annoying, frustrating, any word you can find in the thesaurus for such a thin, shite house of a game this is. So, we finally reached the dreaded rainbow, LJN. Made infamous by the AVGN, Sean Baby and many other chroniclers of terrible games going back to the mid-late noughties, and they've stayed notorious ever since. Obviously there are a lot of terrible LJN games, but rather than fill my list up with all of them, I've simply gone for the one that I believe to be the very worst, and that has to be Uncanny X-Men for the NES. More than all their other games, this is the one that feels the most unfinished. It's a top-down game where you pick two X-Men, one to be played by you and the other by the computer. The computer one is stupid, brainless, they just dash around in a circle firing endlessly, and honestly it's just for the best when they die. As for you, well you get to haphazardly move around this absolute mess of graphics, getting bounced around like a bunny by all the enemies on screen, with not all that much you can do about it unless you pick a character who fires a shot as opposed to one who punches, or more accurately awkwardly lunges forward a bit. Eventually your character will meet its maker, and you will be a much, much happier person for it. Hideous. You may get the impression from me that I really don't like the ZX Spectrum, at least if this is the first video of mine that you've seen or whatever. I, I do. It's the computer that I grew up with, and I adore it. But with familiarity comes a knowledge of a lot of the turds that were made for it. And here's another. Voyage into the Unknown. This game is actually a fair bit like the Great Space Race, and while it thankfully wasn't sold in shops for 15 bloody quid, if anything it's even more incomprehensible. 
Hell, even starting the game is probably a task that flummoxes most people, and once you do, it's pretty likely that you'll just end up dying randomly in some situation that you could do virtually nothing about. Crash Magazine saw fit to give this game the grand score of 9% in 1994, with only the similarly nonsensical Cosmic Pirate score in lower. And if anything, that score's too bloody high. We've actually not seen a lot of wrestling games so far, which may surprise you. I love wrestling, almost as much as I love video games. But naturally most of the wrestling games have come together right here at the very end to give us a bombastic finale, and we can't start the grapple with anything other than the total wreck that is WCW Backstage Assault. Electronic Arts, in their infinite wisdom, decide that what people really want from a wrestling game is one that consists entirely of hardcore brawls with barely any wrestling whatsoever, not even the ability to get into a ring. And the result is one of the worst games in their gargantuan library. Unsurprisingly, no one actually wanted this at all, and the game was a massive, utterly deserved flop. It only has one function, really. It exists as a perfect summary of how dreadful WCW was in its year 2000 death throes. Well, aside from David Arquette winning the world title, I suppose. We've also still got a couple of football titles to go, and this game right here is the one that I believe to be the very worst. World Championship Soccer here is actually a very obscure port of the much more famous and also not very good World Cup Italia 90 for the Mega Drive, and it was made by people who I can only assume had never even seen or heard of football. This game actually gets all the basic fundamentals of the sport completely wrong. Where do I begin? Well, two players from opposing sides compete for the ball at the kickoff, which is wrong. Even though the game's not presented as such, you're actually playing indoor football. The ball cannot go out of play for a goal kick, throw in, or corner. I refuse to believe that this is an indoor football sim, and instead believe that the programmers couldn't be asked to actually program the ball going out of play. And it is, of course, stupidly easy to score. You don't need to shoot. Just get that ball and run it right past the goalie, who simply stands sock still. You can grab the ball from kickoff every single time and do this again and again until you either win by some astronomical cricket score or get bought. The computer will not make any attempt to actually stop you. So, yeah, I think I can safely say that of all the football games that I've played, this is the absolute worst. Cheers to that! And yet, it's not the last one. And even if World Cup Carnival, another specky game, isn't as bad as the last game, it does have another great story behind it. So here's the deal with US Gold's most infamous flop. They managed to snare a license to make an official game for the 1986 World Cup, which is quite a big deal, to be honest. They decided to get their pals Ocean to work on it. Time passes, and with just weeks to go until release, US Gold looked in on how Ocean had progressed with the game, only to find that they had done absolutely nothing, and I really do mean nothing. Absolutely panicking and desperate, US Gold made an agreement with the Alien Arctic software to license their ancient game World Cup Football. Okay for 1984, but utterly past it and awful by 1986. They made a couple of cosmetic changes and they released it as World Cup Carnival. Knowing full well just how shit it was and yet faced with selling the game for a bloody tenner, US Gold filled the box with no end of trinkets, posters, stickers, a match planner, tons of stuff. Now take note 1980s kids, if a studio has filled the game box with a ridiculous amount of fluff like this one, then, <laughs> well, let the buyer beware. Needless to say it didn't work and everyone raked US gold through the coals for this catastrophe. And the final cherry on top? Arctic didn't even have the rights to license out World Cup football, they'd already sold them in a fire sale, and the punishment of having to pay money to Parker Brothers for their crime did the company in for good. Every last bit of this tale is just brilliant, in all honesty. I love it. Say it with me, folks. Mom, can we have WWE Smackdown Here Comes the Pain? We have WWE Smackdown Here Comes the Pain at home. And this is it. World Wrestling Championship. One last tussle in the squared circle with Phoenix Games. It's by far the most obscure wrestling game on PS2, being that it doesn't have any kind of official license or anything, and, yep, it's the worst by a massive distance. Play as a collection of utterly stupid characters, complete with animal soccer world quality voices and taunts, in something that, 
I mean, it's hardly even wrestling. It's a glorified fighting game where you actually beat opponents by knocking them down for a 10 count. I'm not sure you can even do any ground moves or actually pin anyone. All you can do is a basic punch and kick and one or two throws at most. What is even the point of this title? Why does it exist? Would anyone actually buy it when the PS2 had so many WWE games with actual people that you knew in them? Hell, I'd rather shove Backstage Assault into my console and play this direct for another second. It's the absolute worst 3D wrestling game I have ever seen, but I would expect no less from Phoenix. And we couldn't let this list finish without another terrible wrestling game for the microcomputers. It's only right also that it's an official WWE, or rather WWF, game. Of all of them, this is the worst. WWF European Rampage for the C64. Yes, this is actually worse than WWE 2K19 or anything like that. I know that's hard to believe, but it's true. So what's the deal here? Well, there's several funny things. After picking from one of four wrestlers, the Hulkster, Macho Man, Ultimate Warrior or Bret Hart, you fight several people on European tours. It has to be said that especially in singles mode, the list of wrestlers you fight is hilarious. You go up against Erwin R. Scheister, Jerry Sags, Typhoon and Animal. I'm deadly serious. Truly an incredible selection of main event talent. I mean, I know that the WWF was running pretty bloody thin in 1992, but this is just ridiculous. Aside from that, well, have you been paying attention to the game? Look at it! What's also funny is that when you pin people, they're actually lying on their bloody front. The little opposite of lying on their shoulders. It's a frigging Cameron from NXT simulator. I'm really not sure how you get from the original WWF WrestleFest to the middling WrestleMania game on microcomputers to this atrocity. My word. Here's one final terrible game from the almighty Mega Drive, and fittingly it's one of the last games released on the system. Experts. A spin-off from Eternal Champions starring Japanese ex-assassin Shadow Yamoto, she's the leader of a team of crack special forces agents who all suffer from a very severe case of piles, but don't let that interfere with their operations. At least that's what I choose to believe judging from the way they move and their hilarious animations. Experts is the thoroughly sad sort of affair that can happen right at the end of a console's life. In many ways it feels like an attempt to make a 32-bit style game only on a 16-bit machine, and it fails in every possible way. The only good thing about it is the Sega splash screen at the start, there isn't even any music, and those graphics aren't going to please anyone at all. It's the sort of game that signals the death throes. If you'd been loyally sticking to your Mega Drive, this is the time when you knew in your heart that nothing else of any worth was going to come out for it, and that it was time to move on. It's hard to say goodbye to yesterday. And hey, why not have another completely rubbish and utterly ill-advised microcomputer arcade sequel while we're at it? It's also another chance to get into the world of the Amstrad, which is always an experience of sorts. Again, the original Yaya Kung Fu was a very good port on the micros. On most of the platforms it came on, it got the early fighting and jumping around action pretty much spot on. I suppose it makes sense to follow it up with a sequel of sorts, but when all you really need to do is a little more of the same, how do you mess it up so badly? You start with a flick screen bit that doesn't work, you redraw everything to make our poor hero look absolutely stupid, and for some reason you take controls that worked perfectly in the original and utterly ruin them, with the result being a game that is stupidly unfair. You'll be lucky to even get past the first boss, as he's just going to trash the hell out of you with his bloody ponytail. Aside from the odd exception here and there, this seemed to happen with damn near every microcomputer-only sequel to an arcade game. So if you're from the 1980s, and you're planning on making a sequel to a successful arcade game on a microcomputer, I have a little word of advice for you. Don't. That is all. Our last micro game, and second to last game overall, is another excuse for a good micro story, and another stupid tie-in that shouldn't exist. The Young Ones. A game that's almost as incomprehensible as Super Monkey Diboken. You pick a character and just drift around the house doing... I don't really know what. I'm not sure if anyone even knows what you actually have to do in this game to this day. Anywho, the license to the popular and legendary anarchic British sitcom was surprisingly procured by the little-known Olympus Software, and they had plenty of ideas on what they wanted to do with it. 
However, making the game was a disaster. A lot of that down to interference from the BBC and the show's creators, who insisted on having meetings over every little thing in the game and nitpicking every step of the way. Massive delays ensued, the game missed the lucrative Christmas period, it was a badly reviewed incomprehensible flop when it finally did arrive, and it single-handedly killed poor old Olympus software. They went from the joy of getting that license to such a well-loved show to calling in the receivers, all thanks to the young ones. It's not the first time a license killed a company, and it wouldn't be the last. One really wonders why there were so many of the Finns when they could be such a poison chalice. And well, this is it. The last game. It's another wrestling game. But we still have something a bit new for the final entry. A chance to feature the PCFX, and a chance to actually have a proper FMV game at last. Again, I, I really wanted to avoid a lot of the more obvious ones. So here's Zen Nihon's Yoshi Pro Wrestling Queen of Queens, a completely unique combination of FMV and wrestling. How do you play it? <laughs> Buggered if I know. You press buttons and random fins happen. Said random fins involve completely uninterested legendary Yoshi Pro Wrestling stars, often clearly giggling at the stupidity of what they're doing in front of the old blue screen, throwing punches and kicks directly at you or performing um, the first half of all their moves. It kind of sums up all the reasons why the PCFX totally failed. NEC decided to go all in on FMV and multimedia in the 32-bit generation instead of 3D, and games like Queen of Queens are the result of that. Simply watching this game in action is kind of hilarious. Look, let's be honest, at almost every stage of the rise and fall of FMV-based games like this, one thing is clear, almost anyone pretty much had no bloody clue of what the hell they were even making. It's as simple as that. And there we are. Finally. I've done it. I've put together the 100 games that I would consider the worst ever into one marathon video. As you can imagine, it's been quite a wearying experience. Not only have I had to write about them all, I've had to put myself through them all one more time. As much as I often like to focus on good things, sometimes you've got to tell a great story about a disaster, or you've got to wonder just what on earth happened to make something so bad, or... Well, sometimes you've just got to spew invective and vent. It has been an entertaining experience, even if it's also something of a perverse one, to play a hundred dreadful games again and then write about them. And hopefully you've had fun watching the end product. But for now, well, I think I ought to play something decent for a change. It is Christmas after all. Bye for now. Thanks so much for watching this video. If you liked it, then please do like it. Please do leave your comments and perhaps subscribe as well. Have a look at my social media, my Twitter, my Twitch. I stream a lot. I post crap a lot. And if you really like what I do, have a look at my Patreon because you could join this list of awesome people here. Alexa Jones-Gonzalez, Andrew Dalton, Arcade LY Webmaster, Brian Henniger, Chris, D. Xalio Rimron Sutter, Dagorath Dungeon Keeper, Danny Wolfers, David Matuszek, David Rose, Dinty76538, Douglas Miller, Dustin Cooper, Gary Samaden, Glunfef, Jayas Manchild, James Brown, Jace Alexander, Jeff Ladd, Johnny, Kid Cassette, Lukas Kaligowski, Matthias Gramzov, Mike Clayton Travis, Martin Pataki, Nate Milbank, Potter Margell, Ren Biron, Robert De Felice, Rod B, Rusty Kelly, Sam Stoddart, Seth A. Robinson, Simon Gulliver, Stuart Christopher Brownlee, Tariq Amir, Tim Wald, Tom K, Yurka Operator, and to all the rest of the awesome community, thank you so much, Merry Christmas, and goodbye.